today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. So we're in a section of the year where our weekly messages are focused on the story of Jesus. We're turning 100 years old this year. Really, really excited about that and what that's going to look like here in just a few months. And so we're talking about our story this year and our story uh, in large part is the story of the Word of God and even uh, and even greater the story of Jesus and so we're focused right now on his story of course we believe that the story of Jesus is the greatest story that's ever been told we could talk for months and we could even talk for years about the story of Jesus and never explore the full depth and application of what that story means to us but right now we're focused on his early life and the beginning of his ministry. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about his birth when he came and some of the gifts that he came with. Last week, we talked about his baptism. Today, we're going to talk about what immediately followed his baptism and what immediately preceded the beginning of his ministry. If you were running the ministry of Jesus, you probably would not take the pit stop that we are going to take today. Jesus has just been baptized by John. The voice of God has boomed from the heavens, the Father's approval for Jesus as his son. The Holy Spirit has just descended in physical form to rest on Jesus in front of all of these people. It, that seems like a pretty good launch party for the ministry of Jesus. If I was running it, I would want to get Jesus to the largest synagogue in Jerusalem in front of the most people possible as soon as possible. Let's capitalize on all of this momentum. Let's choose an all-star team to go around with them. Let's set up a ministry tour that will take advantage of what we have just experienced. But what we're going to find today is that the Holy Spirit did the exact opposite of that. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will do the exact opposite of what you think he should do, and it's still the right thing. That's why we're following his leading and not following our leading and praying for him to bless that. How, many, how often do we do that? We do it a lot, right? How often do we get in trouble doing that? A lot, right? So we're going to follow the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit even though it doesn't make sense to us sometimes, even though we don't like it sometimes. So let's talk about it today. Matthew chapter number 4, starting in verse number 1. We'll go through verse number 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, that's capital S, the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very Hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the Scriptures say, He will order his angels to protects you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone jesus responded the scriptures also say you must not test the lord your god next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory i will give it all to you he said if you will kneel down and worship me get out of here satan jesus told him for the scriptures say you must worship the lord your god and serve only him then the devil went away and angels came and took care of jesus we did a message that was around some of the same thoughts that we're going to talk about today a little bit earlier around temptation in the year today though we're going to look at four aspects of the temptation of jesus and how we can apply these lessons to our lives to overcome the enemy's temptation of us today we're going to study when jesus was tempted how jesus was tempted and why jesus was tempted part of my Job, part of my responsibility as your pastor is to make sure that you are equipped to do the work of the church and to build up his church. My 
Responsibility is not to save you or sanctify you or fill you with the Holy Spirit. It is to give you opportunities to serve and to give and to go. My responsibility is not to build up my church, but to build up the church. There's a difference. You'll, there's a difference. You'll find leaders often who are really interested in building up their church, and what you'll find is when that leader leaves, so does the church. Not in my notes, just stay here. It's not my responsibility to build my church. It's not my responsibility to build up my following. If you are following me, I got to tell you, we're all in some serious trouble. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to build up God's church. In the process of equipping you to fight the spiritual battles that you are up against to fight spiritual battles against the kingdom of darkness i need to make sure that you know how the enemy fights if you know how someone fights you have a better chance of defeating them right you have a better chance of withstanding that attack i need to make sure that you are equipped with the knowledge of how the enemy is going to attack you when the enemy is going to attack you and what he hopes to gain or why the enemy is going to attack you those are the three things that we're going to talk about quickly this morning number one is when does the enemy attack what can we learn from this tempting of jesus that we've read about here in matthew 4 verses 1 through 11 this morning what can we learn from that about when the enemy chooses to attack if you're a note taker today is your day so often i don't have like a a single point in my messages and if you're feeling the need to make a joke after service about me having pointless messages save it (laughs) but a lot of times i won't just have like hey here's a point here's a point here's a point but today not only am i going to give you three points i'm going to give you three sub points for every point So if you're a note taker, today's your day. Get ready, because I'm going to give you some stuff to write down. Number one, when does the enemy attack? The first thing that we're going to talk about around that today is this. The enemy attacks Jesus when Jesus was alone. The enemy attacks when we are alone. By alone here, I mean away from other people. And alone is not always alone the wrong place to be jesus often went to be alone to spend time with god in this case he was led by the holy spirit into the wilderness or into the desert but when jesus got alone it was to spend time with god in almost every other situation we find jesus in community with other people so alone is not always a bad a bad place to be but it's also not where we should find ourselves most of the time alone should not be one of the themes of our life we talked last week about how god is a god of unity how god is a god of community the first time that god ever looked at something in his creation and said that it wasn't good was when he looked at adam and realized that adam was alone that there was nothing else on earth that was like adam that could be a partner to adam so he created all this amazing stuff and he said hey that's good and then that's good and and that's good and that's good and he created adam and he said that's that's really good that's a good thing but then he realized that adam was alone he said it is not good that man should be alone we were created designed for intended to live in community with each other we were not created to withstand being alone one of the hardest forms of torture that they will use is to put someone in complete and total isolation why because we weren't created to deal with that we weren't created to be alone there are reasons that god does not want us to be alone one of those reasons is that when we're alone we're more more vulnerable to attacks from the enemy we're weaker when we're alone having other people around us who love us gives us a perspective on the attack of the enemy that we may not be able to see when we're alone 
When we're all alone and being attacked, we don't have anyone to believe with us or to pray with us or to keep, help us keep our problems in perspective. The enemy wants you to be isolated because you're an easier target when you are. You're an easier target for him whenever you feel like you're alone. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Like I said, being alone with God, is, it's not a bad place to be. In fact, it's a necessary place to be. Sometimes we need to get alone with God, but we need to know that when we are alone and isolated from other people, we are more, more vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy when does the enemy attack he attacks when we're alone the second the second time is this jesus was tired and hungry when does the enemy attack he'll attack you when you are tired and yes when you are hungry the text says that jesus fasted for 40 days and then i don't know why the holy spirit felt inspired to write this next part or inspired man to write it but it says he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry he could have left that part off we know fasted for 40 days and he wanted something to eat who would have thought i can't imagine what 40 days without food would feel like because it doesn't take me four hours without food come on somebody to get hungry again i can tell you that when you go on an extended fast your body uses up all of its energy on just surviving which means that you are physically and mentally tired there are just certain realities of living in these flawed imperfect bodies and one of them is that when we are hungry and when we're tired and when we're emotional we do not make good decisions so that's when the enemy attacks again we're talking about when the enemy wants to attack you have you ever noticed that you don't make the best decisions late at night when you're really tired Have you ever gotten angry at someone just to find out that you hadn't eaten lunch that day? We even have a word for it, hangry, right? Why? Because when we're tired and when we're really hungry, we don't make the best decisions. For all of those reasons, the enemy will look for a time when you are exhausted and emotional and tired, and that's when he will come to attack the third time that he'll come to attack is this jesus was getting ready to launch into his ministry when you're getting ready to do something for the kingdom of god or if you're already doing something for the kingdom of god then you need to be prepared for an attack it's easy for us to identify when we are alone it's easy for us to identify when we're tired or hungry but this third time that the enemy likes to attack it's much harder to identify because it's something that hasn't oftentimes it's something that hasn't happened yet it's something that's getting ready to happen jesus is about to launch into his ministry the reason that he came to earth is about to begin taking form and the enemy knew that if he could stop jesus ministry before it even began that was his best chance if he could convince jesus that there was an easier way if he could convince jesus to lose sight of the will of the father if he could distract jesus from his mission here on earth then he could win i believe that so many people never fully realize their potential for the kingdom of god because they get distracted by the enemy and distracted by the temptations of the enemy just before they step into their purpose if the enemy can convince you there's an easier way to get what you're about to begin pursuing in god then he wins if he can distract you from your mission then 
he wins. If he can get you to lose sight of the will of the Father, then he wins. Under attack isn't a place that any of us would choose to be, but it's usually a sign that we're doing something right or that we're about to start making a greater impact for the kingdom of God. The enemy does not much care if we come together in this room at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. He's not going to fight you very strong if you aren't making a difference in the fight that he's fighting. But when you're going outside of the walls of the church, when you're making a difference for the kingdom of God, or when you're about to step into God's calling on your life, you better get ready because the enemy is going to fight that with all the power of hell. When's he going to attack you? He's going to attack you when you're doing something for the kingdom of God or when you're about to begin doing something for the kingdom of God that God has purpose we see all of those things in jesus life all right let's let's move on point number two okay so you just got point number one and the first three sub points we're off to a pretty good start point number two how does the enemy attack we need to understand when we're most vulnerable to attack but also we need to understand how the enemy attacks this thought was really the main focus of an entire message that we did concerning temptation earlier this year in the story of Samson. And so if you want kind of a more full overview of this, you should go back and uh, check that out. I believe that it was March 23rd uh, of this year we did uh, the story of Samson, and we really broke all this down. But since we're here, uh, we probably should talk about it again. There are a few ways that the enemy attacks. There are a few ways that he has attacked from all the way back to the garden from the beginning of time, he attacks Samson in these same ways. He attacks Jesus in these same ways in the text today, and it's how he still attacks us today. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of his attacks are going to fall into one of those three categories. The lust of the flesh is a craving for physical pleasure. It's human nature at its core. We want what we want and we want it when we want it which is usually right now right that is the lust of the flesh so what will fix the lust of the flesh what can we learn from jesus story that we read this morning that will help us overcome the lust of the flesh we need a fast fix a fast fix not a quick fix but a fast fix. I'm talking about Jesus went into the desert, and for 40 days, what did he do? He fasted. If you want a way to overcome the lust of the flesh, fasting is a really good way to do that. There are some really, there are some great health benefits to fasting, but there are even more spiritual benefits to the fast. We have a craving for physical pleasure. One of those cravings is food, and when we deny ourselves when we deny our physical bodies even the most fundamental thing that fuels our life in food we crush the lust of the flesh jesus was coming off of a 40 day fast he had crushed his physical desires and his desire for more of god had grown we can have more physical pleasure or we can have more of God. One of the tactics of the enemy is to get us to want physical things more than we want spiritual things, to get us to focus on physical things more than we're focused on spiritual things. If he can get us to follow the desires of our flesh and abandon the spiritual desire for God, then he can overtake us and overcome us. Number two is the lust of the eyes, a craving for what we see. Again, this is human Nature. We have to protect what we let come in. Our eyes and our ears are the doorway to our minds. Once we see it, we start to think about it. Once we start to think about it, we start to plan for it. Once we have a plan for it, it's only a matter of time before we go and touch that thing and we go and get that thing. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the right things. Y'all aren't listening to me this morning. Is it too heavy? We need to make sure that we're looking at 
and listening to the right things because whatever we're letting in through our eyes and whatever we're letting in to, through our ears, eventually, if you hear the same thing over and over and over again and you see the same thing over and over and over again, that thing is going to take root up inside of you. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, that's how we let things into our spirit. So we need to make sure that we're letting the right things into our spirit. It's a way that the enemy wants to attack us is when our eyes tell us that we want things that actually are not good for our soul. The third thing is the pride of life, pride in our own achievements and possessions. Once again, it's human nature. One of the advantages that the enemy has found is that he uses our own flawed human nature against us we have a nature to sin it is in our nature to be selfish it's in our nature to lust after or to desire what we see in the physical pleasures of life and to take pride in who in ourselves it's in it's in our human nature to take pride in our own personal achievements and our own personal possessions the antidote to unhealthy personal pride is to remind ourselves that we are nothing without Jesus. I said the antidote to personal pride is to remind ourselves that we are nothing without Him. That we were totally lost and on our own, and He found us. That we were broken, and He put all the pieces of our lives back together. That we are, were alone, and He adopted us into His family. That we were dying, and He gave us new life. That we were enslaved to sin, and He set us free. That we were dirty from all the decisions that we made, pursuing all the things that our eyes told us that we wanted, and He made us clean. Like the Apostle Paul, if we're going to boast in anything, let us boast in our weakness. Because in our weakness, Christ is revealed at his strongest. Romans 7, 18 through 20 says, And I know that nothing good lives in me. This is Paul talking. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful Nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. What's Paul saying there? He's saying, I want to do the right things. I constantly make bad decisions. It's because my nature is to sin. If the Apostle Paul's nature was to sin, then I'm okay saying that it is in my nature to sin. That if I follow my own path, if I do my own thing, if I please myself, that is going to lead me to a life that is themed by sin. Paul says here, there is nothing good in me. Only a desire for sin. The same must hold true with us today he's talking here about a need for grace and a need for mercy from God in our lives we need that same grace and mercy if we're going to make it through the temptations from the enemy it's not true that God will never give you more than you can withstand it's one of my pet peeves it's not what the Bible says it says that he'll never give you more, more temptation than you can withstand because he will always give you a way out. I mean, just look around. We constantly have things that are stronger in our lives than we can withstand. The enemy, certainly, the power of hell is stronger than my power. It's not that he'll never give us more than we can withstand. It's that he'll never give us more than we can withstand when we are connected with him. The pride of life tries to come in and say, you can stand on your own. 
you can do this. Yeah, you needed grace and you needed mercy and you needed all that to come into the family of God. But now that you're in, you got to earn your keep. You got to earn your spot. You got to make God proud of you. And it's just all that is, is pride. And it all comes from the enemy. Because if the enemy can get you working really hard to belong to the family of God, do you know what you're going to do? You're going to fail and fail and fail and fail. And finally, eventually, you'll give up. That's not the plan of God. The plan of God was not that you would get in or stay in because of how good you are. It's that you would get in and you would stay in because of the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the love that flowed from Calvary from the life and the blood of Jesus. Anything else is the pride of life. Well, I'm better than they are because I go to pride. And if you don't kill it, it will kill you. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. If you don't put that stuff away, it will put you away eventually. It's nothing but pride. So when the pride of life tries to come in, just remind yourself in the enemy that you know who you are because you know whose you are and you know that whatever good you have done, whatever good things you have are all because of the blessing of God in your life. These three modes of attack from the enemy, they're why Jesus spent so much time talking about money and stuff during his ministry more money the desire for more money feeds all of these methods of attack from the enemy a craving for physical things those you know how we get more physical things when we have more money we can have more of what our eyes see if we get more money we can have more room for pride in ourselves and our possessions when we have more money money doesn't have to feed these things but that is why talking about money and keeping it in perspective is so important in the life of the follower of jesus because money can either be good for you in the kingdom of god or it can crush you and play into the hands of the enemy and his attacks on your life that how is the enemy going to attack he's going to attack with the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Number three, okay? Three points. So far, we've had two points and six sub-points. Paul, I'm staying right on it. Number three, why does the enemy attack? Another way to say this is, what does he hope to accomplish by attacking you? Why does he attack? The first reason is this. He wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. That's why he attacked. Satan attacked Jesus in the desert because he wanted to steal his future, kill him, and destroy his eternity. That's exactly why the enemy still attacks you and me today. He'll make promises of grandeur just like he did with Jesus. If you bow to me, he will say, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus was not living for the kingdoms of the world. He was living for an eternal kingdom. That, mm, that's a problem talking about how we're vulnerable to attack and when we fall to attack really it's what kingdom are we living for because when we're living for the kingdoms of the world the ways of the enemy are going to sound really good to us and do you know why because they're his ways when we're living for eternal an eternal kingdom when we're living for the kingdom of god it's not going to sound as good because we're not living for temporal things and that's all that the enemy has to offer is here and now what feels good to us in the moment the second reason that he attacks us is because he wants to erode your faith when we go through seasons of testing and temptation one of the goals of the enemy is to slowly peel back the layers of your faith it doesn't have to be all at once for him We would notice that too easily, and we would course correct. Instead, he will use temptations and trials to slowly wear a hole in your faith. If he can get you to start doubting instead of believing, then he can win. If he can get you to be spiritually 
pessimistic instead of believing in the promises of God, then he can win. If he can get you to talk a big spiritual game but live in quiet faithlessness, then he can win. Number three, finally and really ultimately, he wants your worship. Why does he attack? Because he wants your worship. The final temptation from Satan to Jesus in the desert was for what he really wanted. It was for his worship. Just like God wants to be worshipped, Satan also wants to be worshipped. And what we have to understand about worship to Satan is that it, it doesn't always look like black hoods and midnight and ritual chanting. Anything that is given in worship that's not given to God is worship of Satan. I know it sounds strong. It just is the way that it is. There are two kingdoms. There's not a third alternate. There's the kingdom of light. There's the kingdom of God. And there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of Satan. And you're going to give your worship to one of those two kingdoms. So if you're not worshiping the kingdom of God, then you're exactly where the enemy wants you to be. He wants your worship. He'll disguise his desire by ultimately letting you feel like you're worshiping yourself. So we talked about when the enemy attacks, how the enemy attacks, why the enemy attacks, all of that is knowledge. Now let's talk about what we're going to do with that knowledge. Understanding the attack of the enemy is good, but we also need to know how to withstand that attack. Understanding it is good, it's good knowledge to have, but how are we going to put that into application? How do I withstand the attack of the enemy? That is coming. I hate to be the bearer of all the good news this morning, but if you're following Jesus and you live for long enough, you're going to be attacked. If you're doing something to advance the kingdom of God, then the enemy is going to come in and attack you. We need to know as believers, how do we withstand that attack? Three ways quickly this morning that we withstand the attacks of the enemy. Number one is this, we walk with the Holy Spirit. There are two ways that we can walk. We can walk, we can follow the plan of the enemy and we can walk in our flesh or we can walk in the power of and the authority and the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, starting in verse number 16, says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. These are our works. This is what we would do if we followed our own plan. These things stand in opposition to the works of the spirit. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, enviness, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, okay, so there, here's the opposite of all the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. But the works of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, here it is, listen to this. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. There's the pride of life. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If we want the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we have to be led by the Spirit. We have to keep in step with the Spirit. The only other option is to be led by ourselves and to walk in the flesh. <coughs> Here's something that you have to understand, though. Letting the Holy Spirit lead you 
means that sometimes he'll lead you into the wilderness. Letting the Holy Spirit lead you means that sometimes he'll lead you into the desert. <clears throat> sometimes he'll lead you into a season of preparation. That's exactly what happened in our text this morning. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into a season of spiritual preparation. We have to come to the place in our lives where we understand that preparation is not punishment. So often we get led into the desert. We get led into these seasons where the Holy Spirit means to prepare us for the next season, but we look at it like punishment, so we go sit on our thumbs and we pout in that season, and we don't prepare for what He has for us next. So do you know what? We never get to have what He has for us next because we're not willing to have proper perspective about the season of preparation that we're in because we feel like we're being punished. We feel like we're being overlooked again. We feel like we're being forgotten when actually he just means to take us into the desert so that we can be spiritually prepared for where he wants to take us. Jesus got sent to the desert for 40 days. For most of us, that would feel like punishment. But it's because of his spiritual preparation in the desert that he was able to withstand the attack of the enemy that was coming. Go back and read the text. Jesus gets baptized, and it says, Then the Spirit, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. We already don't like that. He was led by the Spirit into the desert. This last part you're really not going to like. So that he could be tempted by Satan. But he knew that if he would go out there and he would prepare, he could overcome the temptation and then walk into the ministry that God had designed him for. It was because of that spiritual preparation he was able to withstand the attack of the enemy. He prepared before the game. Before it was game time, before it was go time, he was prepared. You guys get this, I don't know, for me, it's cool, you may hate it, but I'm up here talking and you're out there listening, so it is the way it is. <laughs> you guys get this kind of look into our lives, you get to see what's important to us, because that's what we talk about, and in the season of life that we're in right now, that means that you get a lot of conversations about our sons and especially when it comes to Judah right now that means that we talk about baseball a lot that's just because it's what's happening in our life right now so we're in off season with Judah right now for baseball which doesn't mean that we're not playing baseball it just means that we're not playing games we're still practicing we stopped for like two weeks I could have used about six months but we got two weeks and we were thankful for it but right now, almost every time we go to practice, which is about two to three times a week, every time we're on our way to practice, Judah is asking, hey, when do we get to play a game this weekend? Do I have a game Saturday, or do we get to go after church on Sunday and play baseball again? Because I want to play in the game. And I said, no, we're not playing games right now. We're preparing right now. He wants the game, but what he doesn't know is that he, if he doesn't prepare like we're preparing right now, he's not going to be ready for the game. We need the season of preparation so that we can have a chance of success in the game. It's the same thing with us spiritually. We need the season of preparation. We need the alone time with God. We need the fasting so that we can learn to deny our flesh and to push down what our flesh wants so that the spirit can rise up in us because we're either walking in the flesh or we're walking in the spirit. And if we're going to overcome the temptations and the trials that the enemy is definitely going to throw at us, then we have to go through seasons of preparation and we can't waste them. While we're waiting, we have to be learning and getting stronger and growing closer to Christ so that when it's game time, we're ready to play. Seasons of preparation aren't punishment. Seasons of preparation are necessary. Number two is that we have to learn the word of 
God. How did Jesus fight back against the enemy? He fought back each time with the word of God. He knew the word. It was in his heart. Why? Because he was prepared for the fight. I can remember taking tests in school, and I would download into my mind. I would learn all of this information that really doesn't still have an incredible amount of value in my life. I don't know when the last time I used Pythagorean theorem was. I don't remember. But I know it. I learned it. So how much more for the eternal spiritual battle that we're in should we download what we need to fight the enemy today because he's coming against us today and tomorrow and as long as we're here on this earth he's going to continue fighting against us how did jesus fight he jesus was the word jesus is the word and he still used the word to fight back we have to know the word of god if we're going to fight back with the word of god the word of god and Prayer, they, these are the offensive weapons that we have to fight against the enemy. We need to know how to use both of them to not only to protect ourselves, but to protect our families as well. Number three, if the enemy wants to attack us when we're alone, then it only stands to reason that we should make sure that we stay in community. If the enemy wants to attack you when you're isolated then you need to make sure that you're consistently around other believers it's one thing to get alone with god for a time it's another thing to live alone and isolated from others one of those things will help you spiritually one of those things will destroy you spiritually how do i withstand the attack of the enemy walk in the spirit learn the word of God and stay in community with other believers will overcome the attacks of the enemy just like Jesus did and then he went on from that season here's another thing about the season of temptation this is where I'll leave it when we're being tempted when we're being tested when we're being tried Sometimes, Scott, it feels like it's never going to end. I'm here, and I've been here forever. Why does God have me in this time out? What is the purpose of this? Where's the good in this? But here's what you have to know. The season of testing and tempting and trying it's not going to last forever. There's going to be a time where you overcome. Just like in our story today, there's going to be a moment when you break through. And when you do, you'll be able to walk in the fullness of what God has for you because you didn't sleep on, because you didn't ignore the season of preparation that God had you in. That's what we have to come to look as temptations and testing and trials as not as punishments from God but as seasons of preparation where we can learn something new about the character of God that we will need in our next season. Will you guys stand with me this morning? God, we love your word. It's good. It's to us. It's for us. We embrace it this morning, God, and we apply it to our lives. We know that the enemy is going to continue to attack us. After today, God, we're better equipped to understand when that's going to happen and how he's going to attack and what he wants to accomplish by attacking and also how we're going to withstand the attacks of the enemy. Remind us today, Lord, that we're not going to do that alone that we're not going to do that absent each other, and we're not going to do that absent of you. God, I pray that we never have so much pride in ourselves that we feel like we can withstand the attacks of the enemy alone. We weren't designed for it. We can't do it. 
And the good news is you didn't ask us to. But you gave us brothers and sisters in Christ. And you gave us the Comforter. You gave us the Holy Spirit. And as long as we'll walk in step and keep in step with your Spirit, then we'll always know that we're in the right place. Whether the season seems good to us or seems hard to us, we can always know that when we're following the Holy Spirit, that we're in the right place. Let us take your word today, God, and apply it to our lives. We bless your name.